Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. What is with all of these Shimano crank failures? I've done a little video on my theories. It'd be good if you could get down in the comments below, give me any other theories you've got about why these Shimano cranks are failing and what they're gonna do about them for the next generation because at the end of this year, we should be getting 12 speed Shimano on Dura Ace. Now, it's probably gonna be a massive delay due to a certain uh, bug that's going around the world, but I really hope they do sort this problem out. But anyway, like I said, I'm gonna give my little uh, theory on what's going on and thanks to thanks Shimano on Instagram if you haven't seen this Instagram page full of these failures go and check it out it's a really good image library of all of these failures and actually Shimano should be really grateful to this person setting this up because it's probably saved them a lot of time and research and kind of diagnosing the failure but anyway let's get into the PowerPoint so a quick summary of what we're gonna we're gonna talk about um, if you're not aware there's been a lot of failures reported of Holotech cranks. So these are all bonded cranks from Shimano. Um, it's not specific to one generation of crank, it's, it's across kind of a lots of generations, maybe up to three, but you kind of see most of them on 6,800 Altegra, I think. Um, my theory of the main failure mechanism is the degradation of the adhesive. Now that could come from four independent things. Like I've, I've said four, it could be more, there's probably more. Um, or four simultaneous catalysts. Uh, moisture ingress, trapped moisture, the meniscus effect, we'll get to that in a minute, and anodic action of the aluminium on the steel. We'll also come to that and explain what that means. Now, if you're not familiar with Holotech cranks, let's have a quick look at the construction. So you've basically got two uh, clamshells of aluminium, which are fully seam sealed and bonded on the, on the overlap with an adhesive, like some sort of epoxy structural adhesive. Then you've got the steel turn the pointer on. Then you've got the steel axle which is press fit into the aluminium on a spline. So that deals with the, the torque transfer. Now that's a hard press fit and the Shimano axle steel axles are really nice, 24 mil, hard steel, probably cold drawn steel tube, um, really nice, can't really fault them. But yeah that's the basic construction and this is this is a Dura Ace crank. This is actually one of my videos uh, on YouTube, which I posted back in September 2017. If you read what I've written down there, um, proper engineering here, no other crank comes close. Well, now I'm eating my hat. I um, should probably eat my hair as well because it's awful, I need a haircut. But yeah, I'm eating humble pie because a lot of these have been failing and they're not, they're not obviously working very well. So. <laughs> Yeah, I was wrong in that comment. Anyway, moving swiftly on, that's the basic construction of the Shimano Holotech cranks. They got hollow chain rings as well, and this is one of the best things about Shimano crank sets is the chain rings, and that's why I always use Shimano chain rings and cranks because the chain rings are so stiff. I and mean, you look at how thick the chain ring is, but how light it is. So it's a it's an aluminium skin with a very deep cross section, which makes it very stiff in in bending. So when your chain's running at an angle, if your chain line isn't optimised, the gear you're in, um, it means that the chain can't pull the chain ring left and right so much. So the chain rings remain very stiff even when they can be made light. So I've got no problem with the chain rings. Shimano chain rings are the best. They shift the best, they're light, and they're really good, and they last a long time as well. And that's why I'd always pick a Shimano chain ring, either a, a single plate type chain ring, like a rotor or FSA chain ring. They're not very stiff, and the chain can pull them all over the place when the chain's on an angle. Yeah, that's basic construction. You can see adhesive here, adhesive here, or an adhesive here. Um, and I think, you know, the adhesive, the method of using adhesive is, is valid. It remains very light and very stiff crank because you can, you know, make the crank very broad and give it good thickness. Uh, high second moment of area, it's called, but remains light. Anyway, that's construction. Now, why have I got world map on the screen? Um, well, take a guess. Uh, I think all of these failures are coming from the same region. Not all, I'm sorry, they're, they're, they're going to be outliers. But from what I've seen, and I actually have got no statistical data to back this up, but from what I've seen, it's just my, my kind of intuition tells me the failures are kind of in this zone, like this uh, subtropics and tropics zone, is where I've seen on the internet and through friends that I know have had multiple Shimano crank failures. They've all lived in this zone of um, longitude, isn't it, that way. And I don't know if that's coincidence or not, but I I don't know any mates that have done them in, in Northern Europe. I don't, you know, I've, I've, I've been riding in Nor Northern Europe for, for like, I don't know, 20 years, and I've never 
had any problems with them there. And I haven't had any friends in the, like the UK who've had any problems with Shimano cranks. But since I moved to Asia, I've met a lot of people and a lot of friends who've had multiple crank failures of Dura-Ace and Ultegra cranks. And they live in Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia. Uh, Florida seems to be a very <laughs> popular hotspot for Shimano crank failures. This is like the, uh, the epicenter of the virus, isn't it? Florida, Hong Kong, Singapore. This is like the Wuhan virus for Shimano. This is the region where these cranks are failing. Now that kind of tells you what could be happening to these cranks. Well, is it related to temperature? Is it related to humidity? Which is what this, this big band has in common. And I think it is. So I think it's some sort of corrosion of the adhesive based on temperature and humidity. And that's exacerbated by temperature and humidity. I'm not saying that you're not gonna fail them if you live somewhere else, because you will. But it seems to be an accelerated life of the cranks that are being used hard in this region. Anyway, that's just a theory. Like I said, got no really data to back that up. So let's have a look at the Instagram, which I mentioned earlier. And credit to the person who's you know said I can use their images on here. This is a great image library of all the failures. Uh, thanks Shimano is the tag on Instagram. Now, most of them happen in the same way. They start to split between the two clamshells of the crank. And yes, yeah, just they're all just basically a variation of that theme. Um, they're more likely to fail on the drive side, I think, and less likely on the non-drive side. But again, that's just a theory, but I've seen more drive side failures than non-drive side. And yeah, I mean, there's just they're all the same, aren't they? Is it Dura Ace that's peeled away here? The, shimop, the adhesives let go, and the cranks just peeled. And then you do see these very catastrophic failures, like where the shimop, where the aluminium actually ductile fractures. And you might have a mate that says, oh, I had too much torque for the Shimano cranks, I'll snap them. Well, you're not. You're just letting the adhesive get destroyed by corrosion and then it just gives weight because all your weight is on a smaller bit of aluminium. That's what's happening. So don't let anyone, any of your mates say they've got too much power to ride aluminium cranks or Shimano cranks. That's not what's happening. Um, the failure, I think, initiates at the adhesive. And the adhesive line breaks down and then the two arms come apart, just like this one here. This is this is very telling, um, and we'll get to the, why this gap is seriously bad. It's a bad design in a minute, or my theory of why it's a bad design. But yeah, no, it's all it's all a variation on a theme. This one's pretty obvious. What's happened here? All these like white dots. It's like it's like aluminium mould. It's just moisture trapped in there that can't get out, and it just corrodes, and it just it's just spreading like cancer in there. Um, that's just aluminium corrosion on those white dots. You get the same on your handlebars. Um, where you get a mixture of oxygen and, and moisture that can't really escape, you get this corrosion. Um, yeah, I mean, you can scroll down through them all. They're very similar. Anyway, back to the PowerPoint. So, thanks for the uh, images, by the way. Thanks for letting me use those. So, let's ha have a look at like a couple of the main reasons why I think these, these failures are, are quite prominent now. And they're all based around um, moisture ingress, I think, and degradation of the, of the bond. So, I think there's a couple of things happening here. Um, one of them is probably not so obvious to most people, and it's trapped moisture and what I call thermal cycling. Now, this is not going cycling. This is like thermal cycling of environmental conditions. So, going in and out of hot and cold, um, in and out of humid and dry. That's what thermal cycling means. So, when these cranks are assembled and bonded in the factory, now, I guess the factory is in China, Malaysia, or Japan. I don't know. Depends what level of Shimano crank you've got. I think Dura Ace is made in Japan still. I'm not sure. But there will be a certain amount of water vapour which is stuck in this cavity forever after the two halves have been bonded together. Assuming that the cavity is airtight. So assuming that the epoxy creates an airtight seal of the cavity, then any moisture that's in the air during assembly, which there will be, so the air is full of water vapour all the time and it depends on two things basically, the temperature of the air and the relative humidity and that dictates how much water vapour or water droplets are you know, in the air as a gas. When you assemble this and seal it up with the adhesive, that's stuck in there forever. It's like a, it's like a time capsule, the, the water is always stuck in there. Now if you live in a hot country 
where you take the bike out of the garage and it sits in the sun, this might get to sort of 40, 50 degrees in the sun, then all of the gas in here, all the water vapor, water vapor is gonna be the gas. Then if you put the bike in the shade or we put it in the garage and it gets cold at night, the aluminium gets cold very quickly and water will condense on the, on the inside of this. And then the water will condense and run down onto the adhesive parts and a mixture of water and air will start the corrosion of the adhesive. Now, that's particularly bad. Now what I'm saying is that if these cranks are assembled in China uh, in the summer, so it's 30, it might be 30 degrees in the factory, high relative humidity. When you seal this up, there's gonna be a lot of water in it. There's gonna be a large mass of water and you can, using the um, gas equation, you can probably work out, I'm not gonna do it now, but you can probably work out how much water in, in terms of grams is actually present in here. And if you were to get to saturation, um, what the actual mass of, of water. And, and what I'm saying is that this thermal cycling effect, so if it gets hot and cold, hot and cold, hot and cold, um, regularly, like in the garage might do in the summer, then you'll get this constant evaporation, condensation, evaporation, condensation cycle. And that will be particularly bad for the adhesive to cope with that. And it will cause a lot of corrosion in the adhesive. Now, the only way to get around this is to kind of degas this cavity in production. Now, I'm not sure, they might be doing it, but I highly doubt it, because it'd be quite impractical to do in mass production. And what does that mean? Well, it basically means assembling the thing in a vacuum and taking out all the air, and taking out all the water vapor and drying it basically, drying the gas before they seal up. Now, I don't think that's possible in, in this kind of level of production. Um, if you work in you know, astro engineering, <laughs> you, you, you have to do that a lot. But um, for, for this kind of thing, it's probably not uh, dried gas. So, or filled with nitrogen or something like that. So there's an issue there, it's trapped moisture. So it's not just ingress, it's trapped moisture. Um, the other thing that could be happening is like a galvanic corrosion between the steel axle and the aluminium housing. I think this is less likely because aluminium and steel are actually quite similar in terms of their anodic index, which means if you link the two materials with an electrolyte, you join them together with an electrolyte like salt water or water, um, the voltage you would get across them is very, very low. If you have two very dissimilar materials, um, on the an anodic index, you will get a lot of corrosion happening quite quickly. But aluminium and steel is not that bad, even in salt water. So I'll be surprised if there's corrosion happening here. And then what, I th what, I'm, well, what I'm thinking is that corrosion is not the problem. And that corrosion leads to a path for moisture, to further moisture to get in, which will then get to the adhesive joint. But I don't think that's the main, the main culprit, but it's a possibility, but I think it's quite a low risk one. And with the anodic charge, you basically get the aluminium um, negatively charged and there's a path of electrons between the aluminium and the steel and that leads to corrosion basically. But what I think is most likely looking at the images from the Instagram and all the failures that I've seen on the internet is what I call like this meniscus effect uh, of trapped moisture basically that never comes out and it's this join here or well, this gap between the spider and the start of the chain ring where you've got this maybe half mil or even less gap and I think that's particularly bad at trapping moisture or corrosive substances like salt water or salt grime. And I think that's probably the most, most you know, poignant culprit in this whole failure is that this trapped moisture effect. Now, what do I mean by meniscus? Well, I mean like surface tension of the liquid. And if I can sum it up in this statement, I would say if the total surface tension of the liquid in the gap is greater than the mass times the gravity of the droplet, it won't leave the gap. So what does that mean? Well, basically, if the amount of surface tension holding the water in there, in terms of force, is greater than the weight of the, the droplet that's in the gap, it will never leave. Even if you kind of try and you know, fling it or shake it, if you can't overcome the surface tension because the gap is so small and there's such a high surface area, then it's very hard for the droplet to leave the gap. And then what does that do? So you get this meniscus forming uh, and a mixture of air and water, which is particularly bad for corrosion. I mean, most corrosion happens quite violently when you have the electrolyte mixing with the, with the air. Um, there could be some element of anaerobic corrosion, which is corrosion without oxygen, but I don't think that's the likely cause. I think, you know, if you, would, let's say you fully submerge this in water for a year, you probably wouldn't have so much of a problem. 
But if you had it wet, dry, wet, dry, and this interface of oxygen and water, that's when you really start to get problems. It's like rust. You, you won't really rust the nail if it's fully submerged in water the whole time. But if you mix it with air, then you get a real problem. And I think this gap is too small and the surface tension is, is so high that this droplet, it's really hard for the droplet to leave the gap. So this always stays wet after, you've, after it's been humid, after it's been raining, after you've washed the bike, after you've ridden on salty roads. It's very hard to clean this out because it's such a small gap. Now, what can you do about it? Well, not much. You can open the air gap. So the mass of the droplet becomes higher than the surface tension holding it in. So then it's more easy for the area to dry out and then the corrosion stops. And corrosion won't happen in, in, in air. I mean, it will, but if it's dry, your corrosion will just won't happen that often or that quickly. Now, in, I know like in aerospace structures, in, in airframes, there are regulations and guides about um, joint gaps. So if you've got a bonded and riveted or a bonded and uh, bolted joint that can get wet, or can get condensation on it, there are certain, um, basically, rules you follow about how far that is from another component, because if you get water settling in that gap which can't be blown out or, or can't dry out, then it's a site for corrosion. It's like an old car, like, if you've got an old car um, that rusts, you will expect the rust to propagate at, like, panel gaps, or the where two members of the chassis are bolted together, because if this sur surface tension problem it's hard for the water to leave that area and you've got a large surface area so rust 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 on a car panel won't start like in the middle of the panel it genuinely happens between two joints or that's where it spreads from and it's exactly the same here it's not rust because it's epoxy but it's the same physical scenario i think so how can you how can you get around this well like i said you can open up the air gap like you have these guidelines in, in certain uh, engineering practices to prevent this problem. You can use a hydrophobic coating, so you can use a special surface coating or a paint which repels water. Like if you think um, like waxing a car, so that's a hydrophobic coating, so the water beads and runs off quickly, and the surface tension is a lot lot lower. It can't be any surface tension if you've got a really good hydrophobic coating. But actually, the whole thing needs a total redesign because this gap is a problem. I really do think this gap is a problem. Now, I've just looked at my Shimano cranks. I've got two sets of Shimano cranks, 6,800, R8000. They've both got in this gap, like, stuff, like matter, kind of stuff that I can't clean out. Now, I don't know if that's moisture or that corrosion's already started, but it's not good having that tiny gap because it's hard to clean and the water can get in there and corrosion can start. Prevention. How can you prevent it? Well, thoroughly cleaning of the bike seems to work. All the failures on that Instagram look like they've had a hard life, those cranks. Look like they've been really well used. Um, water repellent. So after cleaning the bike, use WD-40 or something like GT85 and spray it in that cavity to try and use as a hydrophobic element to push the water out. And if you see white crust in that cavity, it might be too late. So I contact Shimano before the failure happens because uh, only Dura Ace has a three year warranty. Anything else has a two year warranty. And these failures don't happen that soon because it's a slow process. This corrosion is a slow process. If you can, which is not very practical, but don't store the bike outdoors in high relative humidity or hot temperatures and cold nights because then you get this condensation cycling effect. Um, and yeah, hopefully Shimano know this, know this problem before they signed off the drawings for 12-speed durets and the construction method for that because that's due to be along at the end of the year and that would have been signed off, I guess, you know a good couple of months ago and should be in production so let's hope they've fixed it for next time anyway um a bit of a deep dive there but if you like this kind of thing do give us a like and subscribe and i'll make more videos like this cheers